All right. Good evening. Good to see everybody here tonight. Welcome to the midweek service. Looking forward to a wonderful time together this evening. All right. Take your Bible this evening, if you would. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look, if you will, at verse number 24. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture, and Lord, as we once again look at this important passage in 2 Timothy, those of us who uh, are called by you and are instructed by you how to help those who have been ensnared by the devil, and Lord, I pray that we can all operate and be able to rescue those who are caught in that snare. So help us tonight and help us to receive this instruction as Paul gave it to Timothy and now as he gives it to us as well tonight. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. Help us understand the truth and Lord, help us to live the Bible we learn. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. We talked uh, in the preceding week. Just going in and out. What's up? In and out. And we don't have any answers. All right. Uh, put something on it there. I don't know. All right. We understand from the, we are servants. The servant of the Lord must not strive. And we talked about that and how all of us are just servants of the Lord. All right. And uh, not, not, even, not, not have a servant's heart. Be a servant. All right. We are servants. It's not something we have, not something you try to be, it's what you are, okay? We're servants of the Lord, all right? And, and, and with the teaching of Christ. We're not here to be served, we're not here to serve ourselves, okay? We're here to serve others and to serve our Lord. So the servants of the Lord have an obligation, and yea, it's a responsibility to rescue those that have been ensnared by the devil, all right? And he says here, that servant that we must not strive, that means we're not going to get anywhere by arguing or getting into fights or arguing or striving with other people. And then it says gentle, and we talked about gentleness. The fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. That softness in manners that we have. Apt to teach. We talked about teaching last week, and we talked about patience last week. Okay. Now we come to this one this week. It's in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. So now we're talking about meekness. Now don't, don't mistake that for weakness. Okay, It's similar sounding, but it is not nearly the same thing. Alright? Meekness. We're going to look at what the Bible means when it speaks of the word meekness. There's a definition we have in the Reformers Unanimous program, the RU program. They, they define meekness as the ability to negotiate among others without causing friction. Okay, it's being the lubricant as to help things to go smoothly and not cause friction. So you understand when you're dealing with someone who's you find out, we're going to find out next week, is opposing themselves and caught in the snare. We're trying to help them without causing friction. If you get enough friction going, you're going to start a fire, all right? And you don't want that. And so you want to try to, try to not cause friction. What it is, meekness is when I yield my rights for the benefit of someone else. I yield my rights for the benefit of of someone else okay it's it's a uh, see if I can illustrate it as I was thinking about this there's there's one particular spot in Grove City that if I if I if I ever could lose my salvation I can't 
but that would be the spot I'd lose it, okay? And it is, and the problem is, I drive it every single day, okay? Uh, when I leave church, I got to get on Home Road and turn right on Broadway, and then uh, I get on the second ramp and I head east on two, or west on 270. And right there where you get on the second ramp and you're coming on from Harrisburg Pike, the ones that come straight across are the ones that are turning left off Harrisburg Pike. They have a yield sign. In other words, who's got the right of way? I do, okay? And uh, we come around there and that, that traffic is designed to go on and they're supposed to yield and let you in. They don't do it, okay? They don't do it. And uh, I, you know, now what should I do? Should I say, hey, I got the right of way, buddy, and just go ahead and shove him off the road or let him hit me? Or No. You know what I got to do? Hey, would I be right? Yeah, I'm right. I have the right of way. It's, it's just no different than if you came up, you know, if the light's green, you ever had that experience? The light turns green and you go to go and you out of your corner of your eye catch somebody coming and you stop and boy, they ran the red light. And you thought, wow, good thing I was looking. Now you just said, hey, I have a right to go through there. It's green. Well, you have a right to get smashed up too, okay? Uh, just because you're right doesn't mean that you ought to do it. If you yield, it's better for you and it's better for them too. And so I have to yield, even though I'm not supposed to yield, okay? And I have to yield and let the other guy get in, okay? Do you understand? I have a right to do that, but it's not the smart thing to do, okay? Because I'll have an accident and there'll be, it'll be bad for everybody. I'm not being weak by yielding, I am being meek by yielding. Do you understand? It's like uh, an uh, a cartoon that showed two mules tied together and a bale of hay in front of each mule. Each of them was pulling with all their might to reach his bale of hay. If they just stopped pulling against each other, they would have had plenty of hay for both of them. The caption of that cartoon said this, when no one yields, no one wins. And that's the truth. Meekness matters. If we're going to reach people who've been ensnared by Satan, then we must do it with meekness. We must have that fruit of the Spirit. Meekness, effective teaching, comes from meekness. All right? Now, let's look and see what the Bible says about it. Number one on your paper there, I think, is Paul taught in meekness. There's two scriptures I want you to pick up. Galatians 6, verse 1, and then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 21. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 21, and then we'll look at Galatians 6 and verse 1. All right, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse number 21. Paul says, What will ye, talking to the church at Corinth now, shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love and in the spirit of meekness? Paul is correcting the Corinthians here, and he's asking them, I'll come with a rod or I'll come in love, but I do want to come and I will come in the spirit of of meekness. You can have a spirit of meekness and still be correcting someone. Alright? And, and Paul did that with the church of Corinth. But you see this other word meekness, the, the word meekness in Galatians 6 and verse 1. Paul writes these, these Christians and he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of what? Meekness considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. When you come and you approach somebody with the spirit of meekness, it allows them to listen to the message, to listen to what you're saying, and not feel like you're attacking them and they have to defend themselves. Okay? And, and, and so, meekness. Being able to negotiate with them without causing friction. Now, can you do that? Can I do that? Generally not. That's not in our nature. That's why gentleness, uh, look at, you're in Galatians 6, 
Look in Galatians 5. Notice verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, or the outcome of being yielded to the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So I find out that meekness is a fruit of the Spirit. It's an outcome of being yielded to the Spirit of God. It's not, an, it's not by me saying, okay, I'm going to be meek. That's what I'm going to do. You know what I mean? No, 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 no. It's, it's not by trying harder. It's not by trying to muster it up. It's by me yielding to the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God will minister in meekness. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And so I need to yield to the Spirit of God. Paul exhibited that, both with Corinth and also with the church here in Galatia. Number two, Moses is a great example of meekness. Now for that, I want you to go to the Old Testament. Would you turn to Numbers chapter 12, please? Numbers chapter 12. Moses was a tremendous leader of the children of Israel. A, a, great, a great leader. He had a sister named Miriam, as many of you know, and Aaron, his brother. And they got critical of Moses. Here's what's going on. Notice verse 1. Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now verse 3 starts, and it's in parentheses, isn't it? Who remembers what a parenthesis is in the Bible? Yeah, it's a personal note from the author to the reader. So this is God telling us something about Moses. Okay? What does God say about Moses in verse 3? Now the man Moses was very meek. Not just meek, very meek. Above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. All right, so God's telling us this isn't man's opinion of Moses. This is God's opinion of Moses. So God's telling us something. Now, notice verse 4 then. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out ye three under the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and he called Aaron and Miriam and they both came forth. And we stopped there. I just, I'm not going to, we're going to tell you what happened there. I'm not going to read it all tonight. Uh, but it was, he was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Does that mean Moses was weak? Huh, you know he wasn't. Okay? He was strong, a man of character, a man of strength, a man of great purpose, a man of great courage. But he was meekness. Meekness is best demonstrated in adverse conditions. Moses took great risks and great sacrifices to lead the people out of Egypt. I mean, he took them 40 years for God to mold him, and we'll speak about this later, and then bring them back to confront Pharaoh again and again and again until finally Pharaoh said, get out of here, go. And finally they left. And after 400 years, they're free from Egypt. And, and they get to the Red Sea, and they see God part the Red Sea, and they go over on dry ground. They're led by a pillar of cloud by day and protected by a pillar of fire by night. God provides for them. But they never appreciated Moses. They never had, they never had Moses Appreciation Day. Okay? They never, they never had anything to honor him. In fact, what he usually dealt with was complaining, griping, people unhappy, criticizing his leadership, criticizing his decisions, and now even his brother and his sister are in on it. You know, usually you think, well, I'll count on my family. <laughs> now he couldn't even count on his family. They were critical of who he married and didn't like the one that he married. And so they were, they were at times pretty vicious in attack. In fact, here... Miriam and Aaron say, well, who does he think he is? Think he's the only one that God speaks by? 
Who made him? Who made him the big leader? You know. You know what? Should it? God. God says, uh, I did. Okay. Because did you notice? Moses never defended himself. They spoke this against Moses, verse two, and the last sentence of verse two says, "Who heard it, Moses? No, the Lord heard it." He tells us then in verse three that Moses was meek above all the men who were on the face of the earth. And the first one that speaks in verse 4 is who? God. God speaks. Moses never said anything. Moses didn't try to defend himself. Moses didn't say, hey, you know, I'm the leader here. I'm the boss. God called me. He didn't call you. He didn't do that. He didn't say anything. He let God answer for him. He didn't say, just who do you think you are? He was quiet. And God speaks up. Can I, can I tell you this? God always comes to the defense of the meek. God always comes to the defense of the meek. God calls those three up to the camp. He rebukes Aaron. He rebukes Miriam. And, and all we get from this is probably Miriam had to be the instigator because God struck her with leprosy. Now Moses, being the meek man that he was, he cried out to the Lord on behalf of his sister, even though she was wrong. God heard his prayer, and they waited seven days, but she finally was healed, and they could move on. But Moses is a great example of meekness. We'll talk more about him in just a little bit. But I want you to give you number three tonight. Meekness. Meekness is a spirit. It's an attitude of yielding. Now that's a spirit. Listen. Listen. That's a spirit that we have not only with man, but we also have with God. Don't just, you don't just have meekness in your dealings with other, other people. You are to have meekness towards God. It means meekness towards God is when we accept God's dealings with us as good without disputing and without resistance. A person who displays meekness will even see insults or oppositions by evil men as permitted or allowed by God for His purposes. The example of this is in 2 Samuel. You're in Numbers. Just go to your right there in your Bible, a few books. Joshua, Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16. Absalom has won the hearts of the people. David has had to flee Jerusalem and leave the palace. Ziba comes and meets him. He was one of Saul's servants caring for Mephibosheth and he gives him some gifts. But when verse 5 of chapter 16, the Bible says, King David came to Bahurim. And behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of the king of David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei, when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Wow. Talk about an attack. And talk about someone who couldn't be more wrong. Did David, by a a coup, you know, by a bloody takeover to the house of Saul and then take the kingship? No, he did not. He waited years from the time he was anointed by, by, by Samuel until God gave him the kingdom. He didn't force anything. He was absolutely wrong in what he's saying to David. And then he's throwing stones, not just at David, but at all of his entourage. Now, you remember, David had some pretty mighty men. Okay? I mean, guys who could kill animals with their bare hands. Okay? 
One guy you read about, he, he defended the, the lentils, remember, and killed like 800 people all by himself. You're like, you know, not the kind of guys you want to throw stones at, okay? <laughs> you know, wrong, wrong, picking the wrong, wrong, wrong guy. So here's what happened. One of those guys, Abishai, verse 9. Abishai, the son of Zariah. Zariah was David's sister. Okay, so these are his nephews. Okay, Abishai, the son of Zariah, said unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And he would have done it. Okay, and he wouldn't have swung twice. Okay, and the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zariah? So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth out of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone, and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will quite me good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. It's not the, not the picture of David we're used to seeing, is it? But he's exhibiting meekness. He's not defending himself. He's not insisting on having his way or his rights. He's realizing that, you know what? Whatever comes to me is under God's control. Not my control. And he's saying, if this is what God has brought to me, I accept it. Charles Spurgeon said this, Had any other condition been better for you than the one you find yourself, divine love would have placed you there. If any other position, condition, would have been better for you to be in than where you are, God would have placed you there. But He hasn't. He's placed you where you are. Is God in control of your life or not? Boy, that's quiet. Meekness. See, where I'm accepting what God gives to me without causing friction. God, why is that to me? God, why are you doing this to me? God, how come I don't have this? God, how come I'm this way? How come this? See what we're doing? We're complaining to God. We're causing friction between us and God. Thinking that God did not do the best thing for us, that we know what's better than He does for our life. God knows best. We're in His hand, remember? So nothing comes to us but that He allows it to come to us. Job said, He knoweth the way that I take. When He hath tried me, I'll come forth as gold. Okay? Meekness is not weakness. But let me say this. It is never harshness. Meekness is not weakness, but it is never harshness. Don't use harshness as a tactic to get people to do the right thing. You can, you can insult or shame somebody into doing the right thing, but not for very long. Not for very long. Jesus... You know, it's an interesting phrase. Sometimes you read through the Gospels. They were always amazed because Jesus taught as one having authority, not as one of the scribes. Jesus had authority when he spoke. But, but he never spoke arrogantly or pompously or insultingly to people. We get that way when we feel like somebody's not grasping it quick enough. Or they're not... Uh, no, they're not understanding what I'm trying to tell them. And it certainly can't be, I'm not communicating very well. It must be their dull ears that they can't hear very good. Surely couldn't be me. See? And so I say, come on, man, don't you get this? See? 
And, and I get very harsh. That's not meekness. That's the flesh. And that attitude will render you useless when you're trying to minister to other people. True freedom is found only in who? Jesus Christ. That's where true freedom is. When I'm, when I'm right with Jesus Christ, I don't have to insist upon my rights. I'm right where I need to be in Christ. There's another example of meekness. The forward number four in your paper there. Abraham. Abraham's a great example of meekness. For this, look at Genesis 13, will you? Are you doing all right? Genesis 13, you okay? Genesis 13. Notice with me, verse number 5 says, Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together. For their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the old land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Lot lift up his eyes, and behold, all the plain of Jordan, it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. You know the story. Here they are. They've got to separate from each other. They both have gotten so much, and there begins to be a strife, and there's some ill feelings going on between the workers that Lot had and the workers Abraham had, and then maybe some ill feelings on Lot's part too. But Abraham, Abraham brought the thing right to a... He brought it right to the front, didn't he? He said, hey, we're not going to have a confrontation. He says, we're, we're, we're brethren. What do you want? Look, look whatever direction you want. Whatever you take, I'll take whatever you don't take. Let me ask you a question. Who had the right to take what he wanted? Abraham did. He's the, he's the senior. He's the one that Lot wouldn't have had anything if it weren't for Abraham. All he got was because he was with Abraham. Now, did Lot take advantage of Abraham? Sure. In his mind he did. He thought, I I'm sure. I'm sure when that deal was concluded that day, Brother Bob, I, I guarantee you, there was talk among the herdmen. And I'm sure Abraham herdmen thought, man, did, did, what was Abraham thinking? Man, did he get gypped on that deal. And I don't know if they were placing side bets or anything, but I wonder if they said, yeah, yeah, Lot, Lot got the deal on that one, man. Look at this well-watered plain we're heading towards. Man, this is beautiful out here. And herdmen of Abraham looking, there, ah, a bunch of desert out here. We got nothing, to, nothing compared to you guys. What was he thinking? How could he make such a deal like that? Lot got his way, didn't he? Lot, Lot said, man, I pulled one over on him, didn't I? Now, those of you who know the rest of the story, how'd that work out for Lot? Yeah, horrible, didn't it? The men of, the Bible says, the Lord tells us the men of Sodom in verse 13 were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. When it came time for God to judge Sodom, and by the way, <clears throat> it's not long after this, before God even judges Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, Sodom comes under attack by five different kings and they capture prisoners and Lot's one of the ones that are taken prisoner. Abraham arms his men from his household. And they go rescue Lot. But even then, does Abraham insist on it being his way? And he just brought him back. And where did Lot go? Right back to Sodom. Lot should have said, man, God only blesses me when I'm with you. <laughs> Man, I need to get out of this place and get back with you. But he didn't do that. 
He stayed in Sodom and then God's going to destroy Sodom and He tells Abraham, who intercedes for Lot and his family? Abraham does. That they wouldn't be destroyed along with everybody else. He's an unbelievable example of meekness. Lot got his own way. Lot got his rights. Man, I won that one. I pulled it over on Abraham. But he lost his daughters and their husbands. When he went to warn them of God's judgment, they laughed at him. Made fun of him. His wife turned around and looked back when they were going out of Sodom. Turned into a pillar of salt. Two daughters escaped with him to the mountain. They got him drunk and committed incest with him. And two sons were born, Moab and Amnon. Ammon, the Ammonites and the Moabites, enemies of Israel for generations. A thorn in their side. What about, what about Abraham's choice? How'd that work? Hmm? Very well, thank you. He became exactly what God said he would become. The father of the multitudes. As the sand of the seashore and as the stars of the sky. It led to blessing for him and for his descendants. What a contrast. It goes all the way back when he could have insisted on his rights and instead he yielded his right and exhibited the spirit of meekness. And God blessed that. And God will bless you and me when we exhibit the spirit of meekness. Always seek to yield where you can. Trusting God to take care of you. That has a way of melting hard hearts and bringing the individual who's ensnared to want to yield to the Lord as well. Best way to, the best way to teach someone about meekness is to demonstrate it. Let them see it in your life. And they'll want it in their life. Now, here's, here's number five. So you say, okay, how does God develop meekness in me? Well, God develops meekness in us through adversity. Adversity. Adversity, university. <laughs> That's how God develops the meekness in us. You know the story of Moses. He was brought up in Pharaoh's house. You know, you remember that? Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe and the baby was there and she took him as her own and got his mother to nurse him and brought up, brought up in the palace of Egypt the finest of everything. Not just riches, but <clears throat> education and social standing, everything. You know the story. One day he came out and he came out to see the Hebrews and to, I think, God had, had, had revealed to him that he would be the one that could deliver the children of Israel. That God had placed him in that position to deliver them. And he goes out to visit the Hebrews and there's a fight going on a little bit, a disagreement, and he takes the Egyptian and he kills him. Then buries him in the sand. Now maybe he thought that would be the, uh, the, the signal to all the Jews, you know, hey, I'm on your side. I look like an Egyptian, I know. I'm brought up in Pharaoh's palace. And I, that didn't endear him to the Jews, you know. They would have looked upon him as a, as a traitor or what did he do that he got that kind of privilege. So he's trying to prove himself. Notice what Stephen, I want you to notice what Stephen said about it in, in Acts 7, verse number 23. It says, when he was full 40 years old, that's Moses, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. So I thought, I thought they, they'd get that I'm, I'm the guy, man. I'm going to deliver them. But <laughs> if you're going to exhibit meekness, murdering someone usually isn't the route to go. 
okay? That, that's not the way you want to show that, okay? That's, uh, the truth is, if you ask how much meekness did Moses have at 40 years of age, zero, okay? Uh, none at all. But yet we know, listen, 40 years later, Possibly 50, 60 years later, God said, remember Numbers 12? Who was the meekest man above all men upon the face of the earth? That guy. Moses. Well, what happened between 40 and 100? You know what happened? God put him on the backside of a desert. God put him tending sheep working for his father-in-law. Now, do you remember when Jacob and all of his clan came down to Egypt when Joseph was still there? And they came to dwell in the land of Goshen. Remember what Joseph said to tell the Pharaoh that what they were? Tell them you are shepherds. Because a shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So God takes this Egyptian, which, which Moses, while he knew he was a Hebrew, he was brought up as an Egyptian. And he takes him out to the desert, and what job does he give him? One that he's been taught was an abomination. A shepherd. Taking care of some dirty, stinky sheep. I mean, from the riches and the luxuries and the niceties of the palace in Egypt to the backside of a desert with a bunch of dirty sheep. That's humbling. God was taking him from pride and self-will to meekness and humility. He did it by putting him, by breaking him through trials and pressuring him to do things he normally would not do. You see, Moses had to be stripped of self-confidence and pride. And so do you and me. And God will do that by having us do possibly some incredibly humbling jobs. Some maybe some very shameful jobs that no one else would want to do. But God wants us to do those things to humble us and to break us of our pride and our self-confidence. Notice a verse over in Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi. If you get to Matthew, just keep going to your left and you'll get the last book of the Old Testament. It's Malachi. Looks like Malachi, but it's Malachi. Malachi 3. Now, some people don't know that everybody thinks Malachi 3, they grab for their wallet right away. You know, oh, that's talking about tithing. No, there's more in Malachi 3 than tithing, okay? Malachi 3. Notice verse number 3. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Here it says God sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. See, when God sends trials into our life he does not do it for punishment he does it for purification I read about a man a, a preacher who went to watch a silversmith work he watched as the silversmith put the piece of silver over the fire and let it heat up the silversmith explained that the, the silver had to be in the middle of the fire where the flames were the hottest in order that it might burn off all the impurities. 
And then the preacher thought to himself, that's why God holds me in such a hot spot. That He might burn off all the impurities. Then he asked the silversmith, it was true that he had to sit there in front of the fire the whole time that the silver was being refined. And the silversmith said, not only do I have to sit here holding the silver in the fire, but I have to keep my eyes on the silver the entire time it's in the fire. And I asked him, the preacher said, I asked him, well, how do you know when the silver is fully refined, when all the impurities are gone? He smiled. And the silversmith said, when I see my image in the silver, that I know it's fully refined. Do you understand? God puts us through the fire to get the impurities out of our life. To bring us away from self-reliance and self-will to a place of absolute submission and surrender to Him and what He has for our life. then we're free to instruct others how they too can take the truth of God's Word. That they too can recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. But we have to allow God to go through that process with us. You see, here's the problem. Look this way. Silver doesn't have any legs. What's a deep truth, isn't it? Silver can't run away from the fire. You and I can. We begin to go through a trial. We begin to go through a hardship and the the heat gets turned up. And you know what we do? Get me out of here. We run away from it. We, We want to stay away from that. But as a result, we don't yield to the Spirit. We don't yield to what God wants. And we'll never develop the spirit of meekness. We'll never be able to have a ministry of recovering those from the snare of Satan. So we ask God, God help me to endure the trials that You bring into my life. God, I'll stay in the fire Get the impurities out of me until you see the image of your Son in my life. I'll go through the fire. I want the spirit of meekness. I want to teach with the spirit of meekness. I put a poem on your paper. It's on the back of your paper. It's called The Refiner's Fire. There burns a fire with sacred heat, white hot with holy flame, and all who dare pass through its blaze will not emerge the same. Some is bronze and some is silver, some is gold and then with great skill. All are hammered by the sufferings, by their sufferings on the anvil of God's will. The refiner's fire has now become my soul's desire, purged, cleansed, and purified, that the Lord may be glorified. He is consuming my soul, refining me, making me whole. No matter what I may lose, I choose the refiner's fire. I am learning how to trust His touch, to crave the fire's embrace. For though my past with sin was etched, His mercies did erase. Each time His purging cleanses deeper, I'm not sure that I'll survive. Yet the strength in growing weaker keeps my hungry soul alive. Are you in the fire tonight? Are you going through the fire? Allow God to produce meekness in your soul. You will forever be changed. Even more importantly, 
you'll be equipped to have a ministry to help others who are ensnared by Satan and bring them to be able to recover themselves out of the snare. All right? Now, we'll get to in meekness, it says, instructing those that oppose themselves. What is that talking about? We'll figure that out next time we get together.